I want to share um, from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's an unusual time. Uh, a mother makes a request of, of Jesus, and this is one of those, those moments where um, I'm wondering, sometimes I want to use this on Mother's Day. Did, did mom ever embarrass you? <laughs> Whew, yeah. I think, it's, it's when I got kids, when I got kids, when I was blessed with three kids, hi kids, if you're watching, it was, especially when they became teenagers, I felt it was my role to embarrass them. Anybody else that demented or, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So we've got an unusual situation where in, in chapter 20, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, apparently because they couldn't do it themselves. And kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. Here's that favor. She said, we need to go back one. Oh, he said, what, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, that's not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard it, when the 10 disciples heard this, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said this. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's take a look at this. I got a, got a big butt. It's gigantic, if I'm gonna be blunt about it. And you know what, the funny thing is, I got several big butts. And, and, and before, you, before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well. Yeah, you like that? Hurts a little, huh? Let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something, okay? Everybody we know has a big butt. And more often than not, it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice. But I gotta tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of butt, okay? Even the littlest of butt can distract me. It really can. The littlest of butt can make me think, well, ah, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asks me to do, I seem to have a butt for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big butt of all time is the butt that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading his word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden, a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring. But what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly. Ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. 
but I don't have enough money yet. But others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible, but they won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask, but I just can't get motivated, but I'm afraid. But I don't have all the answers, but the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football. But can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy. But that's not my gift. That's the pastor's job. But I don't know how to pray, but I can't believe that. But I don't know where to start, but everybody else is having fun. Buts abound, friend. But, 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 but. Here a but, there a but, everywhere. A butt butt, okay? And, and, and the most overused butt of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on, we have a lot of butts. God has given us a real simple word, okay? If we learn it, and we share it, and we teach it, and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the butt, okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it. We start the day, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. I like that. Shrink the butts. Do you have a big butt? What's your butt? I was reading about a... Uh... There. Now I feel better. But I was too low. I was reading about a couple who... Uh, their marriage was, was not going well, and they decided to, they needed to go see a counselor... And after talking to the counselor, at some point, he turned to them and he said, you know, one of the most important aspects of, of marriage is to get to know each, each other really well. He asked, how well do you really know one another? And, and the wife said, well, my, my husband has, has never taken the time to really get to know me. Uh, he doesn't even know what my favorite flower is. And, and the husband objected with a big butt. Uh, strenuously objected. He said, no, but I do. I know what your favorite flower is. It's Pillsbury. <laughs> They're still in counseling. But, but we're, we're um, using this time to, to explore some aspects of what I call essential Christianity. It really is more than what you you're put on a t-shirt. Um, and today we find that the followers of Jesus, the disciples of, of Jesus, are called to live by a different standard. Jesus uses that word, but. There's contrasting it to what came before. Paul used that term a lot when you read his letters. A couple weeks ago, we started off with the aspect of worship as an essential, as a follower of Jesus. Last week, we explored learning, and today we're going to look at Serving, that's a third essential of following Jesus. Now, when we look in Scripture, some form of that word, to serve, or serving, or service, or servant, appears just over a thousand times in Scripture. And predominantly what we find is that it's, it's, it's not about finding our identity as, as servants of ourselves, certainly, or even as servants of one another. That might sound a little odd, but we need to begin with the aspect that our, our first response, our first action is to serve God. That's our motivation, to serve God first. And we see this, this aspect very famously in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Many of you might be familiar with this. Joshua has led the people. He took over from Moses and, and actually led the people into the promised land. So in chapter 24, we find Joshua um, is, is he's near the end of his life. And basically what he's done here, he's drawn a line in the sand. We all have to draw a line in the sand. And not only is he drawing this line in the sand for his family, he's drawing this line in the sand for the nation. Here's what he says to his people. He says, now therefore reveal or fear or serve the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. 
put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then here's the big but. But as for me and my household, we will do what? Serve the Lord. That's a big but. This is Joshua's primary primary charge, like I said, not only to his family, but to the nation. This is your priority. Serve the Lord. And serving, what we find is serving is, is involved in every other essential that we're exploring, in worship, in learning, in giving, in sharing. We serve God by dedicating every aspect of our lives to him. And it points to a, an important truth that I've, I've lifted up here several times. God's primary way of working in the world is through the hearts of his people. This is how God works in life. Always through the hearts of his people, like you and I. Joshua insight, insightfully points this out. He says, we have a choice. I think these are very deliberate words. He's thought about this. Choose this day whom you will serve. Our service is a reflection of our love and our dedication to God. Now, we don't serve because we can earn brownie points from God. We don't serve because we're actually afraid of God. We serve out of a deep sense of love and appreciation for what God has done, for what God's doing today, and for what God will do. All throughout scripture, God calls his people to serve. How do we do that? Well, he talks about doing good, practicing justice, love, kindness, and love. The prophet Micah offered his own response to a very important question that he asked. He asked, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high. And then he responds to his own question. He says, I, he has told you, or, more, or mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do what? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And our service to God is measured on how well we serve those around us how well we serve people, especially those who are marginalized, especially those who are poor, the, the widows, those who are without, those who are most vulnerable. For us, for a lot of people, they find that area where they, they serve, it starts with, with pain. It, start, it can even start with anger. Find something that, that you really don't like or someplace where the world needs to be improved and serve. I was thinking about my friend, Sean. If Sean walked in here, you would probably wonder uh, what he's up to. He's, number one, he's a big guy. Number two, he's got uh, his, his goatee is braided. He let it grow out and then he, he braided it. But if um, I follow Sean on his, on his Facebook page, and he started posting these things from something called Disciple Christian Motorcycle Club. And, and these go out, they have big rides. Um, actually, I was talking to somebody, another friend of his, who was talking about riding with him um, and how much fun it is. But they, they conduct what, and they actually, they just did one yesterday. It's called a rescue run motorcycle rides to raise money for an organization called Destiny Rescue. And if there was ever something to be upset about, Destiny Rescue addresses this. Their mission is to rescue and restore underage children who have been, are, are trapped in prostitution or sexual exploitation. That upset him. And so he works to raise money 
and, and works with that organization. I was also, uh, years ago, I read this story about a, a little church in a small town, and this church happened to be right next door to uh, the town funeral home. And just by, happened to be talking to the funeral director one day, and he, he mentioned that there are several families, when they, they do a funeral there, they don't have any place to go, they don't have a church home, so nobody looks after him to, to make lunch. And this just bothered the lady from the church and she went back and, and did some organization, went back to the funeral director and that was several years ago. If you go back to that small town today, this little church as no, is known around town as the, as the funeral dinner church. So if there's a family that, that is going through grief, has a funeral at this funeral home, if they don't have a church home, they need a place to gather afterwards. These church ladies and, and men are involved in it too. They provide a space for them and cook them lunch and just are there for them. That's service. That's, that's a servant's heart. And our service to one another and to the world, it's, it's, again, it's not so that we can score points with God, but because we're called to love and serve one another, and that includes the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized. That's a reflection of our love for God. Long time ago, our, our, the man who established the Methodist movement, John Wesley, he, he compiled and he edited a covenant prayer that we actually use here once a year. If you're here on the first Sunday of the year, I like to use this, this covenant prayer. So maybe you've heard it before. Maybe I need to, to use it more often so we, we don't forget. And so I'm gonna put it up on the screen and you don't need to stand, but I'm just gonna ask you where you are if you would join me in this prayer. Let's pray this together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with who you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you, or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it and the covenant I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Good for you. I mean, do you know what you just did? In, in praying this prayer, you offered yourself completely and without reservation to God and invited God to use you for his purposes. God invites us to be part of what, what he's doing in the world. Serving God is not about using your power, but God's power to work through you. We read this, uh, I shared from Matthew 20 today, and, and the mother of two of the disciples, remember they came to Jesus and, and asked to be put her sons in a place of power. And, and what we find is when the other disciples, Matthew says, when the other disciples heard about this, they were angry. They were upset with these two. And I honestly don't think they were upset with these two disciples, with their two friends, because they felt morally superior. I honestly think it had to do with they got to Jesus first. That's what I wanted to do. That's my spot. That's where I wanted to be. But this becomes, for Jesus, a key moment. He recognizes this moment for what it is. This is, this is a key moment in his, in his ministry, in his leadership. Because here's what Matthew says. Matthew says Jesus called the disciples to him. Here's what he was doing. He was, he was effectively, he was calling time out. He said, guys, we need to regroup here. We need to call a huddle. And we need, we need to get on the same page here. You need to know, Jesus is telling his disciples, you need to know 
what I'm really about because I don't think, I don't think it's what you think it is. And, and here's what he said. He said, he said, here's what happens in the culture. He said, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. In other words, Jesus is saying, people expect this attitude from their leaders because they see it every day. But then Jesus draws that line for his disciples. And I think extension, by extension for us to live life differently, and it's a huge, it's a huge but. Because he says this, but among you, it will be different. Different. Among my followers, among my disciples, it's different. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. We're called to be something different. In Jesus' time, you probably know this, a lot of people, well, everybody wore sandals. And you walk down the street, it was a dirty road. And what would happen is when you, when you walked into somebody's home, there was a place that you could sit and, and a basin that you could sit down and wash the, the road dirt off your feet. And if the home that you were visiting was affluent, if they had a servant, they may have a servant there who would wash your feet for you. But what we find here is, is something different. And what Jesus is saying is that my followers are feet washers. Jesus' followers wash feet. We serve in ways that make people stop and go, well, that's unusual. What's up with that? But then, it, do, it doesn't stop here. For me, the, the most amazing part comes next. Because Jesus points to himself as the servant of servants. You want to know what, what separates Christianity from every other world religion? Here it is. It's how we see Jesus. Here's what Jesus says. He said, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but, there's that word again, but to serve and to give his life, give his life as a ransom for many. With these words, Jesus changes everything. He changes the rules. It's a whole new ballgame. He's dramatic. He's emphatic. It doesn't matter what other leaders are doing. It doesn't matter what the culture around us dictates. In Jesus' kingdom, leaders are not bosses and they aren't there to exert authority over others. Leadership, Jesus says, is about service and it's about making an example. And Jesus follows up his words by providing a powerful example. He just doesn't say it, he shows it. At the Last Supper, Jesus got up from the table and took a basin of water and a towel and did just that. He washed the disciples' feet. To walk with God, to be, to be a disciple of Jesus, is first to be a servant. And just as Joshua's challenge to choose this day whom you will serve, and we all serve someone, we all serve something, and that challenge every day is to choose this day. We're provided a choice every day. And it all comes down to what Bruce Thielman refers to, and I love this, as a basin theology. Maybe you're familiar with this. The basin theology is this. At the trial of Jesus, Pontius Pilate had the opportunity to set Jesus free. But he called for a basin and washed his hands of the whole thing, and he said to the crowd, I'm innocent, see to him yourself. But, by contrast, Jesus, 
on the night before he died on the cross, he took a basin and a towel and served his disciples by washing their feet. It all comes down to a basin theology. It all comes down to a basin theology. And the question this morning for us is, which will you choose? Let's pray together. Almighty God, your people are so thankful. We come today as we are. We, say, we thank you that you accept us as we are. Warts and all, sins and all, struggles and all. And so, Lord, we come here to improve our lives, to deepen our relationships, to strengthen our ties with one another as followers of the way and the truth and the life. And so, in these moments, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit to renew us, to refresh us, and to prepare us to go out into the world and live our lives for you because life in the world has become confusing and difficult. And so, Lord, we pray in these moments that we would reset and re redefine our priorities. Fix our eyes and our minds to stay with the things that you love and those things that break your heart. And so, Lord, in these moments, we lift up our own prayers and concerns and joys that are weighing on our hearts. Remind us every moment of how to be used in your service for those in need, for those who are oppressed, for those who are marginalized, for names that we know and for those whom we will never know. Lord, once again, we're challenged by the words of Jesus, words that are graceful and and demanding for us at the same time. Move us with compassion and grace beyond what we think we need to place to the place where we are struck with awe as we become aware of what you are doing. Lord, thank you for Jesus' words today. Thank you for teaching us that just as we are one in spirit and truth, we are called to serve you with our actions. And so, Lord, break our hearts for those things that break yours. We seek your will and ask for your Holy Spirit to serve us. And we pray all this in the name of the Lord of faithful hearts and actions, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.